We're only eight years away from 2032, the year the futuristic Sylvester Stallone action film Demolition Man takes place. So very soon we'll find out if that movie is correct in its suggestion that Taco Bell will win what is called the Franchise Wars, becoming the only remaining restaurant in America. While that idea might seem like just a cheeky joke, we do know it's at least partly based on what was labeled in real life the Burger Wars, the recurring large-scale comparative advertising campaigns fast food establishments put forth to compete with each other. It was during a late 90s peak in the Burger Wars that Taco Bell scored a major victory in the advertising battle, starting a hugely successful ad campaign starring a diminutive mascot, a tiny chihuahua. Played by a female deerhead chihuahua named Gidget, the Taco Bell chihuahua was featured in a series of commercials in which special effects were used to make it appear it was speaking. The voice was supplied by Carlos Alos Rocky, a prolific voice actor, but perhaps best known to many as Deputy James Garcia on the cop spoof Reno 911 who said he based the voice on Peter Lorre mixed with Ren from Ren and Stimpy. The commercials were an instant hit, and soon Taco Bell was even selling plush dolls of the dog at their locations, dolls which could be squeezed and would then spout one of the dog's popular sayings, such as Viva Gorditas, Drop the Chalupa, and of course, their signature catchphrase, Yo Quiero Taco Bell. But as popular as the campaign was, it was not without controversy, as some in the Latin community felt the character traded too heavily on cultural stereotypes, pointing to commercials where the Taco Bell Chihuahua appeared as a sombrero-wearing bandito, or another where they were a Che Guevara-esque beret-wearing revolutionary. Mario G. Obleto, a civil rights leader known as the godfather of the Latino movement in the U.S., called for a boycott of Taco Bell until the ads were pulled. The campaign was canceled in 2000, and while many have claimed it was due to the pressure Taco Bell was facing from the backlash, others have argued it was more of a simple economic decision, as, despite Gidget's popularity in the role, Actual sales did not significantly increase for Taco Bell during the period the ads were aired. Gidget would appear as the Taco Bell Chihuahua one more time, in a Geico commercial in 2002, and would also be featured in 2003's Legally Blonde sequel, before passing away at the age of 15 in 2009 in the California home of her trainer. Taco Bell released a statement paying tribute to Gidget, saying she would be missed by a legion of fans. Thankfully, her legacy is preserved, as the ads remain easily viewable online, including a particularly noteworthy remembered spot, honoring Taco Bell's tie-in with an upcoming summer blockbuster, in which the Taco Bell Chihuahua tried to lure out one of cinema's most famous monsters with the memorable call, Here, Lizard, Lizard, Lizard. The year is 1998, and TriStar Pictures are ready to take a long-running, iconic Japanese property and give it an American spin, and in the process, hopefully launch a new iteration of the giant monster franchise with... Godzilla. Welcome once again to Failure to Franchise, the show dedicated to some of Hollywood's most infamous mistakes, missteps, and misfires. This is Trev. And I'm Chris. And at F2F, we honk for Screeonk. Nice. That's right. It's time for a a new uh, theme month, which we love. We always love starting a new theme month here. Love a theme. Love a theme. Love a theme. And this time, it's, you know, the other thing that people don't know about us is we're huge jocks. So it's not going to (laughs) be surprising to people that we're doing something inspired by March Madness. Yep. And that is Monster March Madness, a month dedicated to, I like when we say a month dedicated to, which just means two movies for us, but a month (laughs) dedicated to movies about giant monsters. Yes. And this time, Chris, we are kicking it off with style. We are kicking it off off with the movie that made Maria Patillo a global superstar, the, the most beloved, you know, icon of the world. We're talking about a movie that's going to make us talk about Sean P. Diddy Combs more than anybody wants to right now, given recent <laughs> news events. Uh, we are looking at the 1998 American Godzilla. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? For sure. It is directed by Roland Emmerich, a uh, disaster movie extraordinaire. Uh, he directed stuff like Independence Day, The Day After Tomorrow, 2012, Stargate, Universal Soldier. Uh, it is written by Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin. Uh, they are writing partners. And uh, the original script was written by Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio. Uh, they have written actually great movies. Uh, Aladdin, uh, Shrek, Mask of Zorro, Pirates of the Caribbean 1. Uh, Small Soldiers, big fan of that movie. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the budget of Godzilla 98 is uh, somewhere between 130 million and 150 million. Uh, domestically, it made 136 million, and worldwide, uh, it made 379 million, which is okay. It's mm-hmm. below expectations, uh, especially you know at that time you got to kind of double your budget, so it's it's like right there. Uh, but it still was the third highest grossing film of 1998 and the 23rd film in the Godzilla franchise. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think all things considered, this is, you know, we do these sometimes. This is a movie that was not a financial, like, collapse or failure by any means. Mm-hmm. You know, it would have been considered a financial, more or less success. But at the same time, uh, my memory, and I know we'll talk about it, is my memory was the, the, the feeling was in the air pretty quickly after release that, mm, this is still, <laughs> this isn't quite catching the way they wanted it to. Right, But right. But look, this is, a, this is a big one for us. And we, we decided we can't do this one by ourselves. We can't go at it alone. We can't talk about Godzilla by ourselves. So Chris, we actually, for the second time in the history of our podcast, we have guests. Yeah. For yeah. the first time, multiple guests. Um, I, I sent out the Godzilla signal into the Gotham sky And called in a couple buddies, and so we are joined by the co-hosts of the podcast dedicated to kaiju movies, Kaiju Transmissions, and that is my good friends Kyle Bird and Matt Parmley. Hello, guys. Oh, boy. Every time I think I've escaped this movie, it finds a way to pull me back in. (laughs) I said said bury the lead. (laughs) I am uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having us on. No, no, I'm yeah, no. I'm I'm happy to be here. I I've known uh, I've known Trev for many 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 years, and he's pod been podcasting with me for very long time. Yeah, I mean, yep. Chris, I, I hope you don't get jealous, but Bird is actually my OG podcast partner. My no, no, that's fine. Yeah, that podcast. just tell that just tells me that uh, Bird has put up with you for much longer, and he yeah. has much more patience than me. So that's fine. Well, Likewise, sure I've been Matt, driving I'm this. Sure- I've I'm been sure driving Matt Trev would crazy. agree that I'm the patient one here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been driving Trev crazy for well, 15 years or something. Yeah, nice. Something like nice. that. Nice, nice. Um, so yeah, no, it's good to be podcast. here. I, yeah, I, I'm a fan of the the, the podcast. I, I just was listening to. Uh, uh, I'm always like an episode or two behind. I just finished the War Zone, the Punisher War Zone one. Nice, nice. Yeah. That was during, for new listeners, that was during our New Year's Punishment Party, which was not a BDSM month. It was, uh, we did all three Punisher movies, so that was a lot of fun. But yeah, why don't you guys tell us just like a little bit about your podcast, like Kaiju Transmissions. You don't only cover Godzilla, but obviously that's a huge focus of it. But you can say a little bit about the podcast and even just your like your interest in these kind of movies. I'll give Bird the floor. Kick us off, sure. buddy. Uh, I mean, I'm a lifelong kaiju fan. Um, I met Matt, I don't know, 2005, 2006 or something back on, uh, the Monster Zero forums back when message boards were, uh, <laughs> wow. a big still thing. a thing. Yep. Um, but no, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, our, our, our show, we, uh, we talk about, um, not just Godzilla, but we'll talk about, you know, Gamera, King Kong, we'll, we'll talk about. Um, really any, any, any Japanese monster movie, um, or even Japanese science fiction fantasy is, is, is all on the table. Um, uh, we, we try, we try to be somewhat (laughs) well-researched, similar, (laughs) similar to what you guys do and that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll really get our hands dirty in, in kind of the behind the scenes of everything and, um, but no, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's been cool, you know, um, Matt and I have gotten a lot of, uh, cool opportunities to interview, um, different writers, actors, um, directors, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a fun ride. Awesome. How long have you guys been doing the podcast now? About eight years, uh, surprisingly. That's a, that's insane. Since twenty what twenty sixteen, I want to say. Yeah, yeah. I think some of the coolest stuff that we've done, um, like we interviewed Sonny Chiba, who was passed. We got to interview. Um, geez, I'm trying to think of all the different different people that we've had on the show. We did capture Haru Nakajima's final panel uh, before he passed. He's the original Godzilla suit actor. Cool. Um, we've been a part of Kaiju uh, Masterclass, which is like we go out we. Uh, did basically an online virtual conference when COVID was at its height. Uh, so, like, we've done some pretty cool stuff on our show, but I've also been a, a fan of Godzilla for 30-plus years. Um, 
just love the stuff, but also very much into Japanese science fiction and horror movies as well. So it's been a long, like a really fun, long eight years and happy to be part of the show. Cool. Cool. Well, I think that's a great place to start. You said you said 30 years you've been a fan of Godzilla. And I think, you know, I kind of want to test the waters here. Obviously, you guys are huge fans of Godzilla and kaiju uh, cinema and property and everything. Um, like what got us all into Godzilla, the character specifically? Like, I'll start with you guys. Um, well, well, first of all, uh, Matt left out <laughs> one of the weirdest experiences that we've had is we had Sonny Chiba on the podcast and Matt interviewed him in the an abandoned Macy's dressing room. <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> Do 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 other people know about that? Yes, it was not <laughs> it was not part of the Punisher episode you talked about earlier, if that's what you're wondering. Um yeah, we, I went to a convention in uh it was either Louisville or Indi- Indianapolis, I don't remember now, but um they they couldn't get the convention could not secure the normal like venue. Okay. So this, the, a mall had a Macy's that went out of business and we would end up going there anyway. It was, they, they put him right in front of this changing room. And when I was able to do the interview, we just went back in the changing room and recorded the podcast in person, which was cool. fun, but you know, odd, I guess not, not your normal <laughs> recording for a podcast. And, and I guess for, for people who don't know who, who is Sonny Chiba? Oh man, he's, I mean, if you don't know who Sonny Chiba is, you probably haven't watched any of the any martial arts movie or Kill Bill, he's he started the Japan Action Club. Um, I would say, like, when I think of him, I think about probably his role in Kill Bill, but uh, he's been in a ton of different movies. He was a stuntman from the 70s onward, and he just recently passed, um, what, three or four years ago, I think, Bird, something oh, like that. Yeah. So. Well, well, yeah, in the, in the post-Bruce Lee uh, kind of kung fu explosion, he was kind of Japan's... Uh, he was the guy that was, like, Japan's answer to Bruce Lee in the... You know, after Bruce Lee had passed away in the seventies, I think the Sonny Chiba series that like most casual fans would probably know just by name alone is Street Fighter. He's in the the Street Fighter yeah. movies, mm. like, uh, which are talked about in the movie True Romance. <laughs> Christian Slater meets Patricia Arquette at like a, a triple feature of Street Fighter movies. So like, that's Tarantino has always been obsessed with that series and Sonny Chiba. Nice, nice. So the question regarding uh, Godzilla: um, mm-hmm. How did you guys get to this character? I don't think Matt and I's stories are too different, honestly. Like um, dinosaurs. That's my <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. That's, um, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's weird <laughs> to go back, especially you know, for maybe some of your younger listeners uh, who might be used to seeing you know Godzilla stuff every time they go to the store, every time they turn around. There's Godzilla stuff these days, but um, yeah, I I remember I was probably about four, maybe three ish. I don't know, but like any any young uh, young boy of that age, I was obsessed with dinosaurs. I mean, uh, it's all all my books were about dinosaurs. All my toys were dinosaurs. You know, um, I remember going to the science center with my mom, and she says that I told the woman in the gift shop that I needed a Parasaurolophus to complete my duckbill collection <laughs> when I was like four. That's <laughs> uh, obviously, I don't remember that. Uh, I don't remember that part. But uh, needless to say, I was obsessed with dinosaurs. And I just remember uh, one day my mom brought home, um, it, there was a company called Imperial, who back then, um, you know, you'd find their stuff at, at Toys R Us, KB Toys, whatever. Um, and uh, they had put out a Godzilla toy. I think it was about six inches tall. And then they put out another one that was about a foot or so. And my mom brought home the the six inch Godzilla. And uh, there was a King Kong toy they had too. And she gave those to me. And I just thought they were the coolest things. Um, and then it wasn't weirdly enough. I mean, I don't know. I, a kid that young, you just kind of play with whatever your your parents give you. And then um, any any six inch toy you play with. <laughs> yeah and 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 so uh then we i don't know so probably about two and a half years go by and i don't know their toys they're cool whatever um my brother weirdly enough who has like no interest in godzilla like chose godzilla versus mecha godzilla as a movie to rent on new year's mm-hmm. and so i thought that was really cool and then a year later not maybe probably not even a year later i met another kid in my second grade class that was like obsessed with Godzilla. And then I rented Godzilla versus Gaga. And then it was a whole thing that my mom and my grandparents had to deal with, with 
<laughs> you, basically taking me to every video store within a 15 minute radius and i rented and discovered godzilla movies that way um and it's just been a lifelong obsession s- since then and matt's similar eh? yeah i mean i love dinosaurs uh my i w- told everybody i wanted to be a paleontologist when i was like four or five so my dad showed me uh, VHS copy of Godzilla 1985, and honestly, that was all she wrote. Like at that point, mm-hmm. there were a number of uh, releases of the older Godzilla films, and I just started hunting them all down. And then you started getting into things like, you know, in the mid 90s, you had comics and Godzilla toys everywhere. So, um, and I just, it's always a franchise I come back to as like a comfort food. So, and because there's also so many of them, mm-hmm. you know, I can, I never get bored with it. There's always something to, depending on my mood or whatever it is, there, there's something to offer within the series. So it's so funny. Your guys' stories are so similar to mine too. It's just funny how that works out. You know, like uh, something hits, you know, uh, at a certain age and then you're off to the races and Godzilla to me was like, I'm, I'm a big dinosaur guy. I'm on record as Jurassic Park is my favorite film of all time. Like I could write a fucking thesis about that movie, about every single thing that's in there. I just think it's the perfect blockbuster, but I was obsessed too. I had like a dinosaur, like a, like a, month club thing that they'd give you a new a new book to put in your uh, binder that gave you more facts and it came it would uh, come with a glow in the dark uh, uh, a fossil and then by the end of the year you could build a, a whole T-Rex which was cool uh, but then Godzilla when I was a kid uh, similar just going to the video store and wanted anything and all dinosaurs and me and my little brother he's just a couple of years younger than me uh, we probably rented Godzilla movies every second weekend for like a year. Uh, yeah. We just kept doing it over and over and over and over again. And uh, it just became not as obsessive for sure, but but it became like an obsession for us at the time. Uh, I didn't gain the understanding of Godzilla until way later in my life, I would say. Like I, I liked them for the the rubber costumes and and the, the the destruction and the monster battles, but I didn't actually know about the thematic resonance until I was, um, you know, quite a, quite a bit older actually. Like last was, week, yeah. <laughs> in preparation for this episode, yeah, is I when just, you I, learned about it. I, I consumed the original uh, Godzilla uh, yesterday, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of my history. Trev, what about you? Um, well, as you know, I was like 40 when the original Godzilla came out. Yeah, so yeah. you're a contemporary of the guy who was in the suit, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I probably maybe I've talked about this on Kaiju Transmissions before, but I, I like my story is kind of different. What if I was like I didn't like dinosaurs, I just loved Japanese people. But it's it's um, <laughs> mine doesn't come so much from dinosaurs as just being young and being a lo- like in love with monsters and horror in general. And when I was young in like the 80s, especially when I was very young, you know, it wasn't like today where, you know, if you were into like monsters and all stuff, it's not like you could easily just stream all the movies. And I was introduced to like a lot of horror movies when I was a kid by actually going to the library and taking out books of those movies. Like there were these mm-hmm. like black and white books that were, they would tell the story of like the Universal Monster movies and they would have the pictures of the movie. And I like, you know, so, like my first experiences with like the Invisible Man and Dracula and the Creature from the Black Lagoon and stuff like that I was going to the library and finding those books. And then just getting like any kind of books that to do about horror. And obviously when you're checking out those books, like you're going to start seeing stuff about Godzilla. And I think that was probably my first encounter with the character as a kid was reading about him and seeing the pictures from the movies and those books that I was checking out in the library. And then ultimately I was very lucky to, you know, grow up in the Metro Detroit area where we had some really good, you know, like our local channels had pretty good Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon matinees and some of these channels. So that's why I'm really into Kung Fu movies as well. We had a mm-hmm. Detroit channel that had like a Kung Fu theater every Saturday. But a, a lot of the Godzilla movies were shown on TV too. You know, obviously the, the dubbed, heavily edited versions. But as a kid, I got really into those. And then just, you know, fast forwarding to make this quick, like getting to the point where later on when I became like a more serious film fan and getting into like really like cult cinema and, you know, wanting to, you know, watch the stuff that wasn't consistent considered the mainstream by like American standards, then really getting into the fun of the hunt of like going to the store and finding like the VHS of the the, the actual like, you know, the, the other Japanese Godzilla movies I hadn't seen and finding them. And, and and so, and then, you know, getting into it enough, like, you know, same thing as I got into monster special effects and everything, then appreciating it, not just for like the fun of it, but also like, oh, the man in suit and the miniatures and, and just yeah. finding my way into it by that. And, 
you know, ultimately reading G Fest magazine, uh, which <laughs> I, uh, or G Fan magazine, sorry, which I think when I first met Bird, one of the first things we kind of bonded on was he found out that I read that magazine. And so it's like, oh, okay, well, then you're obviously like a, a Godzilla nerd too. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, 1998 Godzilla. All right, let's let's get into the behind the scenes on this film because it kind of has a a bit of a history, right? Um, you it's know, a weird story. It's a very very strange story, and I'm sure you guys will. I mean, you guys have the ins and outs of it. And uh, you know, originally, I know there was talk of like a, a uh, in the '80s or late '80s, <laughs> yeah. there was like a 3D movie that was maybe yeah, in the, development, right? Yeah, yeah. Fred Decker, uh, who uh, wrote Monster Squad, and um, uh, Night of the Creeps had written a script, and Steve Miner was going to direct it. He, he wait, made... can I just quickly say something, Bird? Fred Decker also wrote some episodes of uh, Star Trek Enterprise. Oh my God, <laughs> you son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> um, and and yeah, the the they had William Stout, uh, who Matt and I interviewed about this uh, canceled project for Kaiju Masterclass a few years ago. So that's on YouTube if anyone wants to check it out. But um, yeah, it, it was gonna follow. It was it was gonna follow a kind of a more uh, Gorgo, if people are familiar with Gorgo, uh, kind of template where the the uh, the military, uh, I believe, kills a baby Godzilla, and then you know the the parent Godzilla comes and mm. you know wreaks havoc and stuff, and that that just never happened. I, I mean, I don't know. The the script is kind of, I mean, it's out there if people want to read it. It's it's kind of strange mm-hmm. and it's not that great. <laughs> You, you don't say. <laughs> yeah. But but it, that uh, film d- d- dies. <laughs> yep. That doesn't get off the ground. And then we reach the early 90s where um, Henry G. Saperstein, he's yep. a film producer and distributor, uh, is kind of pitching uh, Godzilla around Hollywood, uh, receives permission uh, to pitch it to Toho directly. Um and then kind of get Sony on board. But I guess I think Sony says no at first. So they, they, they refuse to meet with him. And then they go to Columbia. They say no back to Sony. And Sony says, hey, talk to TriStar Pictures, our subsidiary. So then they talk to TriStar. And then um, what's his name? The CEO of Sony, uh, Peter Goober, is excited about Godzilla, thinking it's an international brand that they want to exploit. <laughs> Goober. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, Basically, they meet with Toho, and Toho sends a document of rules, which is hilarious because in a little bit we'll talk about the movie. But they uh, they give a document of rules on how to treat Godzilla. They I have a quote here. They sent me a four-page single-sided memo describing the physical requirements the Godzilla in our film had to have. They're very protective. So, in May of 1993... Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio are hired to write the screenplay. And this is where it becomes bizarre. Um, don't they, th- they throw out the atomic origin, mm-hmm. right? And they, 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 yeah, take it away. Take it away. You, you probably know this. Yeah. So in their version, Godzilla is like a, a bio, um, like a, a genetically engineered uh, monster that was made in Atlantis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, which is actually very similar. This, I think it's probably just coincidental, but uh, very similar to um, the the Gamera reboot mm-hmm. um, in the '90s as well. You know, it follows uh, this woman who was to be played by Helen Hunt, whose uh, husband or partner gets killed, and so it, it, there's kind of like a Moby Dick element mm. to it, um, and then. She meets, you know, the, the, the male protagonist, which was to be played by Bill Paxton. And, um, you know, the whole thing was, yeah, yeah the, the whole thing was about Godzilla. Um, the, the, basically, Godzilla was, uh, had to fight this shape-shifting monster called the Griffin. And uh, they, the, the, and I mean, I, this is another script that's out there that honestly isn't that great. Better than what we, well, never mind. You told me to save that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there, there's some cool sequences in it, um, uh, but it also wasn't the greatest either, but, you know, there's some cool stuff, like Godzilla, you know, um, like he fights the monster and, uh, like, I think it's the 4th of July and there's, like, fireworks going off and stuff, um, Stan Winston did the monster design, so you can look up the maquettes and stuff of the Stan Winston Godzilla and the Griffin, they're pretty, pretty cool, um, and uh, yeah, Jan de Bont was going to direct this, 
Um, uh, now, since this fell through, um, that is also what leads Jan de Bont, Bill Paxton, and Helen Hunt to Twister. But yeah, that that this fell through. Just it was budget stuff. They, I mean, they they were building the sets and 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 all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's tons of concept art. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was one of those things where, like, they just kept lowballing the budget more and more and more and more and more, which is even more hilarious when the movie <laughs> that they made ended up costing something, like, over twice as much as, as what this one would have cost. Yeah, they, they, uh, TriStar wanted a budget to come in at maximum, like, $80 million. And this script, with Jan de Bond's vision of it, were coming around about 120 to $150 million. And then the movie that got made... <laughs> inevitably was yeah 150 million dollars anyways <laughs> yeah, yeah. W- w- which i think people need to understand that that's a that's a fairly standard high budget like movie by today's standards yes like yes it's really expensive in 1998 can i can i ask bird and, and matt something that i surprisingly don't know but i'm sure they do i because I, I was you know in the same research i'm sure we were all looking at i saw that one of you know they're talking about the other directors that were potentially talked to about this version the 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 atlantis version and you know tim burton was one of them which makes sense to me because like at this point tim burton was still a kind of director who's probably getting offered all these big blockbuster kind of sci-fi properties mm-hmm. but clive barker like bird do you know anything about how close it ever came to being true and what is it like did he come in and say like i want godzilla in bondage gear and like all right get out of here like, <laughs> all i know is I, all i know is probably what you've read I, I i would love to know more um it's one of those questions i just any i i want someone to just ask clive barker i know he had mm-hmm. a pitch for it and i know okay. that they i know that you know he he came in did his thing and they were like i, I no <laughs> so it's i don't know it, it's, it's 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 interesting to wonder if clive barker's pitch would be very like reverential to the material or if he would like want to drastically like reinvent yeah it, you know yeah um yeah, I, I mean, um, so so this is all stuff that's going on here. Now, did you, we, we could discuss what was going on on the Japanese end of all this. Sure, yeah. That's when um, they were doing the Heisei, what is called, Godzilla series, which is like the second time, that, the first time they rebooted. And uh, like, this is a movie that Toho had been desperate to have made for a long time. Like, I mean... They they've kept the series going, and then in 1993 they they do their new the new their then new version of Godzilla vs Mechagodzilla, which was supposed to end with Godzilla dying, and the reason for that was like okay that's the end of the Japanese Godzilla series. The Americans are taking it from here. So then the 94 version uh, gets um, scrapped again. You know. What do we need? What do we do? They, the Ameri- it, it's tied up in development hell at this point. So then Toho compulsively <laughs> are like, okay, we need another movie to crank out. So then they get Godzilla versus Space Godzilla. And then the next year uh, is Godzilla versus Destroya, which, you know, um, at this point, uh, it seems like the, the TriStar version is going again. So that's the big. Um, uh, you know, Godzilla dying was like the big thing, and you know that's the one where he melts down at the end. And the advertise it was it was very much like the death of Superman here. It was like everywhere, and so then they're like, okay, America, here, TriStar, do your do your thing, and <laughs> they did this. Well, they did their thing. Well, 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 they go. This is the thing. They they go to Roland Emmerich at this point, right? And Dean Devlin, yeah. and again they they kibosh the Yonder Bond. They're mad about the budget. They're racing to get this film done because at least they have Toho on the line, you know? Yeah. And any sales guy is going to tell you, well, we got a guy on the line. We got to at least close this deal and uh, and make this make this happen as fast as possible. Yeah, well, yeah, no. Well, the thing with them is, um, like I said, the, Toho very desperately wants to be part of the Cool Kids Club and have, course, you know, the, the glossy American reboot and everything. And it's already fallen through. Um, I mean, like, like I said, the, the DeBont version was, like, ready to go. And then mm-hmm. it was, like, at the last minute, pulled the plug. Um, so Toho, like, they're like, we really, like, we've already delayed. This has already fallen through. We've already, like, delayed the whole um, whole thing where Godzilla's dying in our series. And it's like, we, we need this movie. Mm-hmm. Now, at the same time, Roland Emmerich has been... Um, you know, shopping around. Uh, there's a movie that he's trying to get made that w- had something to do. Um, 
it was like one of those uh, uh, colliding meteorite movies. And Deep Impact and Armageddon were already like in the pipeline. And everyone was like, oh, we already got two of these coming out. Like, no. <laughs> and so he's really desperate also to get a movie made. Um, and he, the, and, and the, now, now the thing is, um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people turned it down. Um, but Toho wants him because Toho was the Japanese distributor for Independence Day, oh, which okay. made them a crap ton of money. And so they pretty much are like, look, you know, hey, you know, hey, Roland, come here, come here. <laughs> we, they're we like, they're, like, they're like, hey, Roland, Roland, Roland. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, look. <laughs> we need a movie you need a movie like come on let's come make on. a movie yeah, yeah. well and... we should say though like, can we just make point like that like roland emmerich getting like brought in at this point makes a lot of sense too when you oh, think yeah. like the timeline of oh, where yeah. roland emmerich was in his career and so let's like, remind people he's coming off of you know 92 he does universal soldier a movie i quite like but then more importantly in 94 he does stargate another movie i'm like a huge defender of oddly enough i, I love stargate never got into like any of like the larger stargate universe never watched like any of the shows but man i still like that movie a lot but then of course the big thing is 96 independence day as you just said id4 yeah. was was gigantic mm -hmm. and you know and like today i know it's like a, it, we look back on it as like everyone kind of realizes it's not the best movie no no no, no. I, think, I mean this is this is your this is what you think and say all the time no this you is what the world me. thinks Chris, <laughs> yeah. okay don't we, you dare but has, <laughs> has, it hasn't held up all too great i know i know no. i'm kidding but, but yes. we all loved it back then, and like the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was just it was a, such a huge hit. And like when you look at like, you know, that did kick that did kickstart this gigantic disaster like porn that became like the blockbuster model for a while. And mm -hmm. so it makes sense to say, well, if we need another God's a Godzilla movie is going to be on some level a big disaster movie, let's get the Independence Day guy. And and what I find fascinating is Roland and Dean Devlin sign on under the pretense that they can do basically whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. We make popcorn movies. We love popcorn movies. Uh, they even say no a couple times. And they have to be wooed back by saying, yeah, well, we're going to do it if we can do it our way. Devlin has a quote here. Both of us thought it was a dopey idea the first time we talked. When Chris came back to us, we still thought it was a dopey idea. <laughs> and, and, and they still sign on to do this movie, which is just tells me right off the bat that uh, they don't care at all about this property in any meaningful way. Sometimes we talk on this podcast where the director has an affinity for the IP or something, that the old TV show, the old movie, the old whatever the hell, and they have a take. They want to do something. From my perspective and through the research of, of everything, these guys' take was to completely do it differently. Well, I, I, Devlin seems a little more sincere in that, you know, oh, you know, he watched some Godzilla growing up, but but Emmerich is the one that really, he I don't know. Hated did, <laughs> he had no respect <laughs> for the franchise, basically. I mean, yeah, that's... I mean, uh, I, you know, whether you have some, you know, uh, uh, that you could read or not, I'm not, I'm not sure. But, you know, there's so many quotes about how, you know, when him and Devlin were trying to write this script, you know, they, they watched like a handful of the Japanese Godzilla movies and were just like, this sucks. Why does anyone like this? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, they hated the atomic breath. They thought that was stupid. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. I know you have uh, you have some interesting stuff about the Godzilla design and when they showed it to the Toho guys, which I, I'm, I'm sure you'll get to. But yeah, it, like, it, it, it's one of those things where, like, yeah, ultimately the, the, the blame is at Toho. They approved it. They, you know, they, but they, they were very desperate, and, you know, they didn't need to say yes to any of this, but they did. But, like, it, it was really, like, one of those things where, like, look, we'll, we'll, we'll let you do, like, just, just, just come make the movie. Like, that's it. And it's interesting you may, you bring up the rules, because um, like I know like they basically did everything they could to honor the rules, but also like get around them in any way they could. <laughs> it's um, the very defiant child that you're trying to parent that like technically, it, <laughs> like the, the, is it wrong, but knows exactly that they're wrong. You know, it's like yeah, that whole like, deal. like like one of the rules they gave them is Godzilla can't die. Okay, so this Godzilla dies, and then at the end there's an egg, and then there's a new Godzilla. Okay, right. that's their way of getting around that one. Uh, <laughs> Godzilla needs to have a like a, a a fire breath weapon, so he doesn't have his classic beam. He 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 breathes hot air that ignites that ignites like 
Yeah. <laughs> it's really bizarre. Uh, uh, Matt, what's another one? Um, uh, can only eat fish. He can't eat anything else. Yeah, he which, can't you know, eat. Which plays he, a prominent he, he, role in this movie. Yeah, Godzilla can't eat people. So what do they do? They show, like, the baby Godzillas eat people. Like, it's stuff like that. that right. Like, the... I think you kind of get, like, I, Bird's on to something about Toho. Really, the blame is should be laid on Toho. But that's not what happened when you talk to people about it. Um, in the aftermath of the film, it's always about, you know, Emmerich and, and, and Dean Devlin. But the reality is, like, Toho, this is their property. They could have said no. They chose yeah. to try to make the money, which I understand that, right? They're trying to make a financial decision. Yeah. One of the, the things to think about is in the aftermath of the film, the fans were had a very adverse reaction. Right. Um, <laughs> but part of that was, like, nobody blamed Toho at, in that moment. Like, I don't remember people being mad about, like, what the Toho do was, like, they were mad of, of the studio for making it. And that's just kind of a weird position to take. Cause this is Toho's property. They could have been like, nah, we're not going to do this. They chose not otherwise. It's yep. that weird thing where it almost works out well for Toho. Right. Cause like they can like, they can sign off on it and let someone else go off and make the mistakes. Yeah. And then they look so innocent and then people come out. And I know like the talk coming out of me was like, I guess that just shows only Toho knows how to do this. Right. And you know, Americans can't make Godzilla movies. And so, and then Toho gets to just like lean back and be like, Haha, yeah, we look pretty good. Even though yeah, the week, no, week they're just I, cashing I mean, the paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> when this movie came out for God, like Godzilla fans, like I was reading G fan at that time, and you know I was going to the conventions at that time, and I it was like the world was ending. But I, when we get when when we get into the aftermath, though, I I do think, and I guess I can kind of leave this as a little teaser. I think that this movie, the the net positive of this movie after all this time, I think has been better than worse. I, I think we're better off having this movie than not. So we'll 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 talk about that when we get to the you know, the fallout and the aftermath of this whole thing. Well, you, you started to uh, lay the seeds of the design. Okay. And we, we really have to get the design not out of the way. Cause we'll talk about it when we talk about the movie, but again, Emmerich uh, wanted to completely reinvent Godzilla's design. My whole concept was based on totally changing Godzilla. He's too fast. I wanted to start new. Like I've like, I had the idea for Godzilla like yesterday <laughs> And how would you do like a movie like this today? And he hires Patrick Tatopoulos to do this. Mm-hmm. And uh, remember that name, <laughs> Tatopoulos, <laughs> Tatopoulos, <laughs> Miss Tatopoulos. Um, like he saw Stan Winston's designs that they had made ready to go for the '94 Godzilla, and he actually disagreed with them. He thought this was the wrong approach. This he felt to me. He was more respectful in some aspect to not try to alter the Godzilla that was done for generation and just step on to doing a new creature, a new direction. You still have the spirit of the old Godzilla within that new guy. Only now can we really present Godzilla in the way that I think the original authors intended him to be, which is lethal and fast and agile and with a few new tricks up his sleeve. And he wants to just do a totally fresh new design. He does not want to, quote unquote, you know, just mold the old design and make it, uh, you know, just slightly off here and there, make it a U.S. version. They want to just completely redesign this thing. And he takes inspiration from Shere Khan, the... uh, uh, the Jungle Book uh, uh, tiger there with his big chin. Uh, he wants this thing to look like uh, an iguana that had mutated, which is part of, you know, the, the, I guess, the origin story in this film, of course. Instead of standing upright like Godzilla does, he stands, you know, horizontal, parallel to the earth. Uh, he runs, he jumps, he climbs, he burrows. Uh, he's very agile, very different, and very animalistic. This is a big part of what I want to talk about, obviously, or I mean, me, we all are going to talk about during the review, is that this Godzilla is by design made to be an animal. First and foremost, he's an animal trying to survive, which, again, for anybody that knows Godzilla, eh, that's, that's different. <laughs> it's, it's different from what Godzilla actually is. Uh, so what uh, Bird was alluding to... The anecdote of Tatopoulos <laughs> unveiling this design in a two-foot maquette with a meeting with Toho, uh, he says, or Emmerich says here, they were speechless. They stared at it, and there was a silence for a couple of minutes, and they said, could you come back tomorrow? <laughs> Which I think is great. 
And then, uh, basically, uh, the, the Toho guys say it was so different that, you know, there was no room for even little adjustments. It was just completely baffled by it. But then, uh, Tomoyama, who's he, by the way, in the whole Toho world? Uh, so Shogo Tomoyama, as far as, like, the Heisei, I'll, I'll just say this in, like, plain terms that anyone, you guys and anyone listening can sure. understand. In the 90s, he was, like, the Kevin Feige of Godzilla. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So he meets the producer and creator Tomoyuki uh, Tanaka, yep. who mm-hmm. is uh, under the weather <laughs> in a bad way. He's, at, he's, he's very ill, and he does not uh, attend the meeting. And he explains the design. He says, I told him it's similar to Carl Lewis with long legs and it runs fast. Uh, then the following morning, uh, they approve the design. So this goes back to what you guys are saying because I, I think you you guys are so on the money by saying the blame is with Toho. We know now more than ever before when it comes to these big brands that have their grubby hands over their IP that they can approve or disapprove whatever they want. Mm-hmm. And absolutely Toho wanted to be part of the cool kids crowd. They absolutely wanted a piece of the pie. They wanted the US market. They wanted to make Godzilla way more international than it could ever be and again i get it i get it to a point but you're right that the aftermath it's like you know emmerich you're an asshole dean devlin you suck you know matthew broderick fuck you <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> well like and i like i was saying earlier i do i and I, I honestly wonder and i you know if you guys have opinions on this i honestly wonder if that was part of the thinking of toho if there was any like calculated thought of you know, if this works, then great. We've got two versions of Godzilla that we can market. Yeah. We've got the original, which is and the basically new like what they're doing now. Yes. Yeah, and if it and if it fails, then we don't take any of the blame. We get right. we come out of it looking like, well, we we know how to make the real Godzilla, and we can like wait a couple years and then come back with a real Godzilla movie. So it's like um, it's all win win for them to a certain right. degree. Right, and and it, it, with Emmerich too, like what he was really going for, and you know this uh, design that he was making to uh, Tatopoulos do. Um, and Tatopoulos was even trying to keep some things, like some of uh, his concept art has the blue atomic ray and stuff, and they just kept mm-hmm. saying like no. But um, I have a newer a newer quote from from uh, Emmerich because um, he really didn't want to do this movie, <laughs> and and so he says uh, I didn't want to do Godzilla, but they made me a deal which was unheard of, which I'm assuming is m- money. Um, and then he he go, goes on to say I said okay let's go about this really radically. I'm not doing Big Belly Godzilla, I'm doing him as a lizard. That was supposed to tell everyone at Toho that I can't do this movie. (laughs) (laughs) And then Toho said, oh, well, we'll just call this the new Godzilla, the Hollywood Godzilla, and then we can still do our fat Godzilla. Our Godzilla's a lot leaner, that's the first thing. The exercise craze has even affected Godzilla. The man must be taking aerobics or step classes or spinning or something. Um, So right there is like... this was almost like a ballsy, like, here's my version, expect- almost expecting to, like, get out of having to do this. Yeah. And then Fire they're like, me. oh, it's fine, you know, we'll we'll go with it anyway. And then he's just like, oh, crap. I've watched, like, comedy movies with this, like, premise, right? Where someone who's, like, <laughs> trying to get fired and then just keeps, like, failing upwards. Yeah. Like, like the producers or something. Yeah. <laughs> or something. This is George in the Penske file, you know? This is, like, yeah. <laughs> um... So so yeah, I mean it gets approved and then they do their script. Poor poor Elliot and Rossio had nothing to do with this movie, but their names on it. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think it's because there's like one scene that is kind of lifted from the '94 version, and because of that, that that's why their names on here. Uh, interestingly enough, Rossio wrote uh, Godzilla vs Kong and the new one coming out. Oh no shit! I didn't know that. Yeah. So leading up to this movie, let's just jump into a little bit of the marketing here, okay, before we jump My into the movie My favorite part. Yes, the marketing, this was a wild time. <laughs> um, in 1998, I was probably nine years old, and the marketing fucking spoke to me in so many ways. I had texted my sister uh after watching the movie again and i was sending her uh the taco bell commercial with the little dog godzilla's hiding and it's up to you to find him just buy a medium or larger drink if you find godzilla use your decoder to reveal what you want 
Uh, I was sending her the the, the music video uh, "Come with Me" by <laughs> by D- P Diddy, which again, poor choice of words for a title of a movie that uh, he's you know for a song. Uh, can't talk about that guy anymore. <laughs> but uh, that song is a banger. I'll say that right now. The teaser trailer where. Uh, Emmerich uh, filmed it himself for $600,000 and it was uh, in a museum where you see a T-Rex a skeleton and of course in 1998 this is one year after The Lost World as well and the T-Rex is the star of Jurassic Park um, and to see the T-Rex uh, skeleton in the museum you hear the thump 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 of something outside that's really big and then this huge foot steps on the T-Rex basically announcing that Godzilla you know, or I guess the T-Rex has nothing on Godzilla. So come see our movie. Uh, I just felt it was it was unreal, the, the amount of marketing. Um, Oof, yeah. Taco Bell contributed like $20 million in media support to this thing. Uh, Trendmasters manufactured a bunch of toys. And I will say off the bat... <laughs> Poor Trendmasters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is like their downfall story. Yes. And, and uh, well, I will say I, I did try to contribute... To uh, to keeping Trendmasters alive because uh, I had many many toys from this uh, this uh, property. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> uh, lots. The action figures of the Frenchman. Uh, the I had uh, Nick Totopoulos with a bunch I of had all, and yep. shit. I had all just, that stuff. Can we just talk about how dumb it was though for them to make action figures of the Frenchman like that? You you'd walk into Toys R Us, R.I.P. By the way, you walk yeah. into Toys R Us and you would just see shelves upon shelves of these like action figures but very little like monster stuff well it, anyway. they they wouldn't I mean, I sell the monster stuff till after the movie came out yeah i can't get behind you matt because i i see no problem with i walk into toys r us i want a jean reno action yeah same figure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you remember they there they were they're like whole skyscrapers would have this like several like 40 story billboard that would say like he's as tall as this building, building. Yeah. Yeah, that's one uh, thing I wanted to ask you guys because I don't remember this w- that well. But they did they do a very good job keeping the the look of Godzilla's secret all the way until the movie came out. Oh yeah, it leaked. Oh, yes. well, it, 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 it did it, leak though. It leaked, but it 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 leaked in like I mean it leaked onto like like this is like fairly early days of like you know the yeah, nerd internet. That's... So like <laughs> you know it, it leaked onto like I'm sure like a site like Ain't It Cool or something. I first saw the leaks in G Fan and with a big headline that said our worst nightmare um uh and and uh, i think it was like one of the taco bell kids meal toys like the sculpt for it like some yep. a picture of it started circulating um yeah. but it, but i it, as far as like the general public i i mean only they didn't people, know. nobody else knew yeah, yeah. it was like so only most of those so most of the toys didn't hit the stores until like the weekend after it came out or whatever. Yeah, or the, the only toys you could find before that were like the people and and things like mm-hmm. that, and things that yeah. didn't show Godzilla. Um, and uh, it, the 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 marketing for this is, um, I mean, you guys said at the beginning. I mean, that you I've. I listen to the show. You guys talk about how weird Hollywood accounting is all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the that's this is a really interesting case. I'm not sure if you've talked about another movie where this has happened. It's happened a few times, but this is one where, like, yes, the box office was surprisingly strong. Um, even in Japan, this is still one of the top ten Godzilla highest attended Godzilla movies. Um, over there, they count in ticket sales rather than like numbers because they don't want to deal with inflation and stuff right um but uh what sunk this movie's profitability was the marketing um i don't like this is one of the probably to this day one of the most expensive marketing campaigns for any movie and like at the end of the day it just the, the the even though like the production budget was made up they did not make up make nearly enough to cover all this marketing and yeah. um same thing with trend masters i mean trend masters as a toy company was already in a, a little bit of a downward spiral but the 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 those toys did not sell well and it that just like re- it it's not the sole contributor but it's a very big contributor to why they're not around anymore um i one of the reasons that i think that we still get these monsterverse movies is like they're moderate box office hits 
but it's the it's the toys and yeah. stuff that yeah. sells. Sa- same with the, the Transformers movies. Like I, the the last one that was like a real like box office success was several movies ago. But mm-hmm. the toys just sell like crazy, and this movie just didn't have it. And it a lot of people probably lost their jobs. And uh, <laughs> yeah, but but yeah. I that that teaser though that you were talking about is is brilliant. It's still one of my favorite movie trailers ever. Same. Um, Played and, before, uh, played before Men in Black, I think. Yeah, yep, that's yeah. Why I, I, remember I, seeing it. I remember it. Yep. I remember it extremely well. And and I don't know. The, now I'm just being like nostalgic old guy, but <laughs> I remember the, like this is before like on the internet. Like now, trailers are mainly seen on the internet. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, this is even before you know. You you went into a movie. You didn't know what trailer you were gonna see. Sometimes you didn't even know a movie was gonna exist until you see a trailer. I mean, I knew they were making an American Godzilla movie because you know I was reading all the updates in G Fan and all that. Um, but I remember seeing Men in Black and seeing that trailer, and then like, I like, it, like was like shook. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh my god, like this is this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like. I barely remember. I remember there was like a tornado f- warning and the streets were flooding and the, the theater lost power and we all had to get sent home and then I had to go see Men in Black the next day, but like I didn't even care. I was mm-hmm. just on such a high from this Godzilla teaser. Yeah, it's all, it's awesome. It, it's a, I can remember it clear as day as well. It was It's such a uh, core memory, definitely. Uh, I think, I mean, I think it's time to talk about the movie proper. How about you guys? Oh, Let's do boy. It. In the wake of nuclear testing in the South Pacific Ocean, the low-profile scientist, Nick Totopoulos, is summoned by the U.S. military to shed light on the mysterious attack on a fishing ship. Before long, a mutated, scaly nightmare in the form of a giant lizard threatens to level New York City. Deemed Godzilla by the local news, it's up to Nick, Audrey, Victor, and a ragtag group of Frenchmen to put an end to Godzilla's reign of terror before it's too late. Why does Godzilla attack Manhattan? Why does the military egg him on? What plan is being hatched to stop him? Let's discuss. I'm just going to ignore all those puns and instead say that, yes, of course, a ragtag group of Frenchmen is exactly what you think when you hear Godzilla. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's. I think it would be proper to, uh, to let our guests go first on this one. Uh, so, um, Matt, I'm actually going to start with you. If you can just give your quick, uh, just overall thoughts on first of all, like, what's your like kind of basic history with this movie? Like, how many watches has it been for you in your life? But then, just like a quick overall thoughts on it. You know, maybe in the past and then today, how you feel about it? Yeah, I was uh, 12 when I saw this, and I remember before the movie, my dad was like, "Hey, I hope you don't get your hopes high for this movie." It was like he knew something was gonna, you know, go wrong. <laughs> he read the um, reviews but, that morning. <laughs> yeah. You know, the funny, like, the funny I, thing, your, your dad just did that for every movie you ever saw in a theater. Like, Hold on. This, this might suck. Hold on. It's like, 
This is let me let me get you uh, ready for the future of <laughs> being an adult. Well, I, you know, it's like he knew how much of a Godzilla fan I was, though, and I think he was just like, man, this is probably not going to be what you think it is. And he ended up being, you know, right. I just remember the first third of the movie has the the typical Godzilla setup, and actually, I I think the first third of the movie there are, there are definite issues, but I enjoy it. Once Godzilla shows up, like uh, it it crushed twelve year old me. Um, I have never walked out of a movie so disappointed as I did that day. Now, hey, the world goes on, like, but like, for for being twelve and this being my favorite fictional character, mm-hmm. I just remember like, man, that sucked. Now I went home and I played basketball with my friends and life moved on. But like, in that moment, like, I was like, man, this was nothing that like I expected. Um, hated the creature design. Hated how Godzilla was was treated as a monster it behaved it looked nothing like godzilla but also behaved nothing like godzilla mm-hmm. um hated the jurassic park stuff that they basically ripped like ripped off from <laughs> the, the raptor stuff like i just <laughs> all of those things just took the life right out of me um i've probably seen it five or six times i don't revisit it often i've watched it with my son my oldest son landon um but it's not one for obvious reasons that i enjoy so i don't revisit it and i don't really feel that different about it today um the thing that I think is is the net positive for this movie is less about the movie and more about what happens after the movie, as kind of Bert alluded to early when he was chat- chatting about it. Well, your son, you watched it with him for this rewatch? Did you rewatch it for this podcast? No, I mean, like, it's such a core memory that I have it okay, okay. pretty much memorized. I watched it with Landon probably a year and a half ago. So what did, what did he think of it? He liked it. So, like, I mean, it was a monster movie for him, and he was he was cool with it. Sure. Which is fine. Like I, I think one of the cool things that comes out of this film is it does create a lot of new Godzilla fans and it gives them interest in the franchise. And yeah. so like I, I think for him that's a very similar kind of deal. He just he enjoyed the the movie for what it was. Uh my experience wasn't quite it wasn't as visceral as, as Matt's was. I I, I I went through something that uh I just I like to describe as the Phantom Menace syndrome. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. If you remember, you know, all those people coming out of the Phantom Menace, like, this is the best movie ever. I, I, I wasn't that, like, crazy. But I, I, I really kind of wrestled with it because it, 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 it was a really cool time to be a Godzilla fan. Uh, I I'd mentioned earlier, you know, when, when I was 3, 4, you know, those Imperial figures, that was it. You know, every now and then, you know, Dark Horse or whatever might have a Godzilla comic book and then... There was the Trendmasters line um, before the '98 film, and and that was really it. And 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 to so, so to suddenly have Godzilla be everywhere and have something like people were asking me about, you know, as a kid, that was really cool. And I, I definitely really was swept up in the marketing and everything. Now now when I saw it, I was a little perplexed, um, and and so I saw it a few times when it came out in theaters, just because I was just kind of like trying to wrestle with it like uh, but there was always something weird about it and um it's a movie i've seen i don't i mean i couldn't tell you how many times i've seen it i mean i have a complicated history with this movie in in terms (laughs) of you know i mean you're a 12 year old and this is like the movie you've been looking forward to for years and it's like you're gonna keep going back and trying to like find something to like about it and uh, that's kind of what I was trying to do. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of went through like the stages of grief where it's like denial and then eventually, <laughs> you know, you, you, you lead into like acceptance. But uh, so, so it's like when I think back on the time, I think more about just what it was like to be a Godzilla fan than the movie itself. Um, now, the movie itself, I don't think is aged particularly well. And my, my feelings on it as a film are probably similar to how it, how they were back then when I finally reached that acceptance stage of, like, it's really not very good. Uh, now, there's some things that uh, I do appreciate about it, mo- mo- mostly in the technical side. Mm-hmm. Um, the CG is a little spotty, but considering the ambition behind it at the time, um, a lot of it is fairly ambitious, and it's stuff that no one was really doing that at the time. It's one of the last movies that has a really solid blend of uh, practical effects and CG, and it was like the last gasp of that. It was like this, Starship Troopers, and a couple more. Uh, as far as the characters go, they're all pretty bad. I, I, I like Jean Reno in this movie a lot. 
Um, Broderick is okay. Everyone else is really trash, though. Um, <laughs> the score is okay when it's not aping John Williams. Um, the pacing is bad. It, it's the dialogue is bad. It's I don't know. I've seen a lot of people say like, "Oh, it's a good movie. It's just not a good Godzilla movie." But I, I just don't. Yeah. I just think it's a bad movie in general. It sucks. <laughs> yeah, that's that's, yeah. More, that's that's what I want to bring up. Because Chris, I'll I'll let you go last on this one. I'll just jump in now because I, you know, my experience is different. And just that I'm a little older, so I didn't see this at twelve. I saw this at seventeen. But I think at seventeen, you're still kind of at least for me, it was still an age where I really wanted to like the things I was excited about. And sometimes you could still do that thing Bert was talking about where you kind of would walk out of something. You know, I had that with, I did have that with Phantom Menace as well, you know, yeah. like convincing you, you yourself. You will like, yourself to like it in a way. Right. But I, but what I remember with this one is I remember, and Bird, you were kind of alluding to this, I actually remember just being more confused by it. Because, like, it's the kind of thing where, like, I'm trying to, like, will myself to liking it, but walking out of the theater knowing something wasn't right there, right? Like, something, why didn't that click more? Why wasn't this movie as exciting as I thought it would be based on the marketing and just, you know, when I bought my ticket going to the theater? Why do I feel a little more deflated? And honestly, it's not a movie I've revisited that much or often. Like this, I did rewatch it for this because I hadn't, I haven't, you know, done the Bird and Matt, you know, rewatches for any reason. So it's been a long time for me. And I wondered what it would be like coming back to it because, as Bird just alluded to, there's definitely been in recent years this kind of revisionist idea that, like, well, it's not a good Godzilla movie, but it's a pretty good giant monster movie. And I've always been aware nah. of like that contingent of fans, yeah. And that's so I went in thinking like, well, I don't know, maybe I'll think of it that way. And no, I think I probably disliked it even more on this watch than I initially did because I no longer was even, I had no impetus to even will myself to to you know pretend to like it. And <clears throat> the the flaws just seemed like more glaring to me this time. I, I think its biggest flaw for this kind of movie is I, it's just boring. It's really really boring. It's not yeah. an exciting movie. And the human characters are a big part of that for me. I think they're, at least I, I also like Jean Reno, but pretty much everyone else is like a total failure of a character <laughs> on a script and dramatic level. Yeah. And, you know, it's so like you said, the effects are spotty and like the, and there are some good effects, but the effects that are bad are so bad. It was kind of really like, Eeks. yeah, the, the and, one that sticks out to me is when he first comes out of the ground oh, and yes. it's like the first time you see like all of him. Yeah. Um, and, and that seemed, that's just bad, but there's some stuff that, that like for the time is, is pretty yeah, ambitious. I'm not, no, and I, well, as we talk more, I'll, I'll mention some of the things I did like, but it was just, I, it, it's like, yeah, I just revisiting it. Any hope I had that maybe I'd have a slightly like more positive take on the movie it was just more and more dashed the longer the movie went. And by the end, I just felt kind of exhausted by it, by how, boring and like uh, just i don't know like static it felt to me um so now chris why don't you, maybe you'll tell us we're all wrong and you think it rules but <laughs> okay are we gonna have a van helsing moment I don't, know. We're gonna... <laughs> don't don't do it don't do it chris welcome to my trap <laughs> no no i'm kidding okay so uh i am very much i'm glad matt you brought up your your uh son uh, because I was very similar age to your son when I saw this film for the first time. And as a kid, you know, I think I, like, again, I think I said earlier, like I was eight or nine years old and, you know, I was coming off of two Jurassic Park movies. Right. And I, I, I have a nostalgic affinity for this movie. Like I, I, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, answer your whole, all your questions <laughs> in, in kind of two phases. Okay. Like when I saw this as a kid, I think I saw this like 20 times. Like I had the DVD immediately. Uh, you know, I had the soundtrack, I had the toys, uh, me and my brother used to watch this. This is the kind of movie, this is the movie that kind of got me interested in Godzilla. Just like, you know, Matt said his son did, you know, it's kind of like a, it's just like an, uh, to see a big giant T-Rex, for two hours as a kid was fun. And then seeing a bunch of raptors at the end too, it's like, yeah, fuck, give me more of that. So in my kid brain and it being a simpler time and I was a little bit, you know, simpler brained at that point too, you know, uh, I did love this movie as a kid. Um, I had, I had a great time with it. Watching it now after all these years and, and especially after seeing Godzilla minus one uh, last year, like we haven't even brought that movie up at all, but Godzilla minus one is slightly better than this one. Slightly better. <laughs> I, I, I actually listened to your guys's kaiju transmissions of, of that episode uh, and subsequently the Monarch TV show, but we can talk about that at another time. Um, 
But minus one to me was like the Godzilla movie. I'm like, this, this gets it basically perfect. And to watch that movie just a few months ago and then to revisit 98, the contrast is, is beyond stark. You know, we had mentioned that the design of the, of the, the Godzilla is just very animalistic. Right. And that's where I think it's, it's, it's such a failure at being a Godzilla movie. Like I'm going to, I'm going to kind of push back on what Trev's saying that you can't have it be an okay creature feature. And then a Godzilla, a Godzilla movie. I think you can separate it a little bit. Um, for the sake of this podcast and this being a Godzilla movie in name as well, yes, it's a it's a fucking failure. Of course it is. Like a, like duh, right? Um, this is less kaiju and more dinosaur, right? Mm. It's just an animal, and he's just trying to exist and survive. And I think a fundamental flaw in this film from keeping it from even being a good Godzilla movie is that it does not treat it as a character you know it's just some creature running around the whole time uh he's neither sinister nor heroic it lacks magic it lacks uh, mystery to it um still watching it now it's, it's a little cool to watch this big creature be so agile and run around and its craftiness and stuff uh jumping on buildings and getting chased by like 50 helicopters which is so crazy um so there's still a little bit of fun to be had. Uh, just, I think, looking through nostalgia glasses, for me personally, I think the first third, I agree with Matt. The first third actually has a lot to like about it. Um, I like all, all the Godzilla tease sequences. I, I yeah, like. the, especially when he's, like, coming up to the the, 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 the dock with that little mm-hmm. old man. Yeah, that yeah, part's that, awesome. Hey, Joe, gonna catch one of them little fish in the East River? <laughs> I hope so, but you never know. I mean, today could be my lucky day. The only thing you don't want to catch is a cold. <laughs> that scene is still so iconic. Uh, I, I've mentioned the YouTube yeah, I channel. I liked it the first time I saw it in Jaws. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, all right. <laughs> cool it. <laughs> um... I uh oh okay you know what I'll 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 talk about that for a second. This is definitely Emmerich trying to be Spielberg without any of the mm. talent. So yeah. okay, I'll say that. Oh yeah. Yeah. But that doc scene that, I mean that's his whole career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. The doc scene is still super iconic and I've mentioned their YouTube channel a bunch of times on this podcast but Corridor Crew does a um like a VFX artist react series. And they just recently actually um, uh, looked at that scene and actually this movie, almost all of the scenes with Godzilla and uh, it's incredible miniature uh, effects. Oh yeah. It's so, so good. The composite work is, is better than most movies nowadays in that scene. As much as I dislike this movie, I love uh, going through like photos of like the behind the scenes, miniatures, the practical effects. Oh, it's like... so cool. Even so cool. even like they built a big Godzilla like a uh, torso that was like huge. They for some shots they even ha- they mm-hmm. did have a guy in a suit, uh, and like yeah, the behind the scenes stuff of this movie is really cool. But the creature, <laughs> he just lacks like that force of nature. You know, there's just not a clear personality, and I think that's a huge flaw. So when he's destroying the city. In the beginning, which I still I still like it. I still think it's entertaining. I think it's fun. I, Hank Azaria running after him with the cameras is, is fun to me. But I can still see that this is Emmerich's like um, excuse to make uh, you know d- destruction without any anything meaningful. Not there's no meaning to the deaths or destruction in this movie, which which is so funny because of the origin of Godzilla. The character is all about that. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what I mean. Like to clarify what I said, like the reason I the reason I push back on this argument that it's not a good Godzilla movie, but it's an okay giant monster movie, is because you have to remember that there are more giant monster movies than just Godzilla. Mm-hmm. So when people yeah. say that, I just think, well, yeah, but if that's your argument, there's tons of like non-Godzilla giant monster movies that are way better than this. 
And then if you push forward and even say, to Chris, to your point, that this is more of like a dinosaur movie, there are much better dinosaur movies. <laughs> right. Sure. Yeah. No, of, co- of course. And of in course. fact, there was, a di- there was a dinosaur movie the year before that had a better Godzilla sequence in it. Yeah. It, does. Like, it does. It does. Yeah. So it's very, and I, I even wondered at the time, like, I didn't know, like, I don't know how much of that scene in Lost World was Spielberg, like, knowing a Godzilla movie was coming and, and trying to have some cheeky fun with it. But it is interesting that like the Lost World ends with a Godzilla sequence, and then yeah. Godzilla ends with a Jurassic Park sequence. Well, it, it's interesting. Uh, it, totally. It's interesting to hear Spielberg say that you know he saw minus one, like he saw it like three times or something. When this movie came out, he said he wouldn't see this movie because he didn't want it to ruin his like nostalgia and his connection to the original Godzilla. So I, you know, yeah, I, I think. Lost World was more his homage than, you know, yeah. oh, hey, guys, next year, <laughs> Godzilla's coming out. I don't want it to be four people just totally ripping on this movie as well. So, like, again, I, I do. Well, I, yeah, but you're, 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 you're a curmudgeon. <laughs> you're, you're a curmudgeon nowadays. But, like, like, I like this movie for the most part until it becomes a complete Jurassic Park ripoff. I think at that oh, well, point that, it that's becomes when, like, that's, that's when, when it, it, it just breaks. That's when it it becomes almost unforgivably bad. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I agree. I agree. It's funny too because it's so American. Uh, respectfully to you three, you know, let's make an American Godzilla. You want Godzilla? Where well, we got fucking two hundred of them now. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, that was obviously them saying, "Oh, we want to make a Jurassic Park movie." You know, I. The thing is, in in hindsight now, in 2024, I mean, I, I honestly, like, I I don't really love the Godzilla design, but, like, I can live with it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if you want to see this design act more like Godzilla and be in something that's actually good, um, I highly recommend anyone listening to check out the animated series. That acted basically as a sequel to this because I'm, I'm so glad you dropped, brought that up because I watched that live on Fox Kids. Oh, every so did Saturday. I, it, and, and it's surprisingly, uh, like it's when great. The, I don't, they they put out the whole series on DVD like probably around the time the 2014 movie was coming out, and mm-hmm. I you know I bought it. I was like, oh, this probably won't hold up, but like it's still really good. I mean, and uh, like they had a top tier writing staff. They had like mm-hmm. you know a lot of great comic book writers like uh, uh, Len Wein who created Wolverine and uh, like Marv Wolfman and uh, you know they had a, an awesome like rotating roster of guest voice actors like Linda Blair and Ron Perlman and, yep yeah um, but the, the, that kind of shows that like yeah it's not so much the design as this it doesn't act any way like Godzilla like but no the animated series is probably one of my favorite Godzilla anythings out of the 90s in general it's really good and I, I, I'm very shy of saying it justifies this movie's existence. <laughs> I, I just for the listeners that don't know that series, you know, the end of this movie, an egg hatches and Godzilla's son. There's one left, and in the the animated series, it kind of uh, retcons that a bit. And when that Godzilla uh, hatches, uh, Nick Totopoulos is there, and it kind of um, attaches to him almost like a father son thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically Nick and co can kind of like not control Godzilla, but it's like, he's like their friend and he protects the city, protects the world. He fights other giant monsters, which is great. Um, and it is a really fun show. It looks great too. The animation is cool too. It does. Uh, It looks awesome. It looks awesome. Trev, did did you ever watch even a bit of it? I sent you the, I sent you the intro (laughs) to it, but have you seen this show at all? I mean, bits and pieces, but I mean, yeah. I've never given it like the watch. Like, I feel like maybe I, I should based on what they say about it. But yeah, it's not something I've I've done like a deep dive into. It's one of the last right like really good Saturday morning cartoons from yep. like the 90s. Can we, I mean, can we take a moment though? Because we've been saying so much about Godzilla and the, the design and I'm sure, you know, we might say a little bit more, but can we talk about the human characters? Can we talk the about Simpsons Matthew cast? Because <laughs> <The Simpsons. laughs> like Bird, know, like Bird knows, and well, I met knows by this point too, like for me guest starring on their podcast a lot, probably nobody talks more on or wants to talk more on like their show about human characters than I do. <laughs> like that. And Bird's always known that about me. That's like a big sticking point for me in a lot of kaiju mm-hmm. movies where it's just like, you know, if I can forgive like boring or dumb, you know, human storylines when you know the kind when the movie is otherwise giving you like awesome miniature effects constantly or just you know batshit insane plots or whatever but this is a movie where some of the kaiju stuff is really boring and like Mm -hmm. a lot of the running time then is instead dedicated to this cast and i want to ask you guys like 
how much of this even feeds into Roland Emmerich's just general disinterest in this movie? Because I'm trying to figure out... Okay, I'll, like I said, we all agree, Jean Reno innocent. Jean Reno yes. is awesome in this. His character is very funny. He's just such a naturally charismatic performer. Um, I always love seeing him, and he's he is the highlight of this. Oh, do you call this coffee? Well, I call this America. There's something to say about how, of course, the American Godzilla movie shifts the atomic, the the atom bomb atrocity yeah. onto the <laughs> yeah, French, to the French. <laughs> and <laughs> absolves yes. America of any responsibility. But no, but, no, he's but like every other character, and like especially when I talk about our, our two leads, Matthew Broderick and Maria Patillo, like. It, this is what I mean. Like, I wonder if it's like Roland Emmerich just didn't care because I'm assuming he saw what the performances they were giving. And <laughs> he was like, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's good enough. And like, and mm -hmm. you burden Matt, you might not know this, but we don't like to talk shit about actors in this podcast. No, but, we don't. Uh, no, we don't. But, but that aside, Maria Patillo is like atrocious in this. Like it's yeah, like really, oh, yeah. really bad. But she is, she is a cutie. And you know, oh, she's a little cutie pie. We're, 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 she, I had a huge crush on Audrey. Still do. Uh, but her, her and Matthew Broderick, no, no chemistry. No, um, I, I like her. I like her better in her no. very small roles in uh, both Friends? Natural Born Killers and True Romance. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> no, she's like in True Romance uh, and both Natural Born Killers. She's got like one like scene. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't help but feel for her because. Her the character's career, not well written. I know. Like her, her well, yeah. career just came and ended with this movie. And I, yeah. I mean, you guys talk about sexism in Hollywood a lot. I, I, I feel like a. A male actor would bounce back from this much. Well, you know how easier. I know that's true because Matthew Broderick's career didn't end, and I mean it didn't end after he killed a guy. <laughs> yes, <it's... laughs> also true. Yes. Hey, hey, we don't we don't like making fun of actors that actually do things that kill people. Okay, uh... <laughs> but he's. I, I think I would. I want to argue that I think he's because I someone said earlier that they thought he was good in this. I think he's bad in this. He's horrible. And I also, I, think, I don't mind I think, him so much in this. No, I don't know. he, 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 has he seems completely, of... completely out of his depth. He's so I, flat. He the, the question I want to yeah. ask is like, why is he even like the lead in this? And I know it's like a weird thing to say because like you know sometimes people make strange casting choices and it sometimes pays off. But you know Matthew Broderick is a guy who by this point you know in '98 his his best his like mega stardom days were behind him. Right, he was still a dependable actor. He would have to wait a little bit again before he'd have. Oh, I guess it's just a couple of years later when uh, no elections the next year. <clears throat> Jeez, he gets he comes back hard with election. But you know <laughs> it had been a while. It had been a while since Ferris Bueller and Glory. Right, right, right. Like right. It, you know so. I don't know why you cast like Matthew Broderick to be the lead in your well, super high budget action movie. And like, maybe the thinking is like, Oh, he'll be funny, but I don't find him very funny in this. It's, it's a bizarre character. Most of the stuff is the joke about how no one can pronounce his last name Totopolis. He, he know. studies worms. That's a joke too. That they the worm guy. He's the worm yeah. guy. He's but the even, worm guy. But even like, like, like he's supposed to be this super smart scientist that they, they, the, the military goes to immediately to, to talk about this Godzilla attack and everything. Right. And he's supposed to be our expert and also audience surrogate a little bit, right? To explain everything that's happening in the whole movie. But he never seemed, like he seems sure, but not super sure about everything. So it's like the way he talks, he's very much like, oh, yeah, that's happening. Oh, there's a nest? Yeah, okay. Whoa, nice to see you, Audrey. Okay. Yeah. Like, he's, he sounds like, he just seems like he's got perpetual, like, Spielberg face. The well, whole this movie. Is what I, this, this is, so this is the question I was building, too. Because I asked, like, why do you think, like, you cast someone like him? And, like, why, why this performance? Do you think Matthew Broderick's, like, both the character as he's written and, like, his casting is an attempt to recapture or capture Jeff Goldblum as Ian Malcolm? Is that their thought? Because it's like... You know, Ian Malcolm well, was not the lead of Jurassic Park, right? But he's the he was the one that everyone loved, and he was the sure, he took sure. off. Then he's the lead of the sequel, and you know, uh, Jeff Goldblum was also not a traditional action star, but something he was catapulted into that level. You know, when you look at this movie, it's so clearly built off of let's try and ape Jurassic Park as much as possible. Was it like, well, we should just make the science nerd like the, the lovable, funny science nerd? He'll be our lead because people like that character in Jurassic Park. Yeah, they're definitely going for like. I, I think they're going for someone that's a little more like shy and reserved than Malcolm, but they're definitely going for the like, okay, who's who's the nerdy scientist mm -hmm. that you know can be kind of charming and you know he's not funny like Malcolm is. I don't no, even no, think the he's movie not. the movie doesn't even try to really make him he's funny the way nor, Malcolm is. Nor sexy like Ian Malcolm was, right? right? Like that's the whole idea. Like that's what I get back to with the, with the chemistry between him and Audrey. We learn halfway through the movie that they were engaged or they're about to be engaged to be married. So they were together for years, you know, and there's just like zero, 
either sexual tension or romantic tension. It just feels like two like college buddies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I felt like. Like, come on, he he has no game. <laughs> it is weird because like they in an early scene with him when he's driving him through Chern- Chernobyl to collect worms, like uh, you know before he gets recruited into this Godzilla mission, we see how in his car he's got pictures of Audrey, like you know like mm-hmm. s- like right there in his dash, and then later get them set up in his tent. So this is a guy who like he is still obsessed with her to this day, yeah. clearly. Like he's still, and then the first time he sees her in the movie, he's kind of like. Oh, Audrey. Oh, it's, like, oh, well, yeah. hey. it's like, wait a minute. You have pictures of her up. Why are you, Why is this reaction so subdued? Oh, I'm glad you wanted to be a reporter. That's so good for you. Okay, okay, bye. Like, yeah, he does, have... does nothing to woo her back. <laughs> I, have, I have two unrelated but kind of related questions. The first one is, did you guys like it when they gave Godzilla pregnancy tests? I was just wondering how you how you felt about that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's and, how those work. <laughs> and then the other the other question I had is when you have something really, really important, do you label it top secret and then like put it on top of the table? <laughs> or I mean that's 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 movies. <laughs> but, I know, I know. But I'm it's just... but it's but it's also like the big fish pile has a big fish logo on the DOS X, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like like the movie, the movie's dumb, and it treats your audience as being dummies too. So it's like, I, it's just ridiculous. Was that Red Letter what Media I, who, like, when they showed the giant fish thing, the guy, like, is it Rich? Is he the yes? Like, they, he like they, lost they, they, his they, mind. Yeah, they videotape him watching the movie. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I should. Pro- I haven't seen that. I need to check that out. Yeah, it's funny. Um, it's funny. What's interesting to me about this movie is actually the way they treat the military, because like the military is basically shown to be more or less inept the majority of the time they yes. wreck more of the city than godzilla does which is kind mm-hmm. of like the opposite of what i would have expected going in and and i thought you know and, and also the the not the the captain or whatever he's just as dumb as matthew broderick <laughs> like he he's uh, yeah uh, I don't uh, what's know his name? Doug, 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 Doug Savant. Doug Savant. Yeah. yeah, it's really strange because I agree, but there here's a here here's again where the movie's making a crucial mistake. You could actually push that even further and have it become like darkly comedic. Well, that could become like the point, right? Where it's like, oh, the military is like doing all the destruction here, and Godzilla hasn't done anything. Yeah, and that might be like a really interesting take and be like a fun movie if that's like the point. Like, oh, this like act, they, oh, Roll Emmerich made this secret satire Godzilla movie where like the kaiju is not the problem, the military are. But like you, as you said, in most of the scenes, they they have the the mayor, Mayor Ebert. We'll get to that. Uh, he calls <laughs> out that the military has caused more damage at one point than the monster. But like. At the end, the, we're still supposed to feel the military's victory, right? We're still supposed to be yep. rooting for them. And I think that's where the movie makes a mistake is that they should have pushed even farther and been like, no, Godzilla is who we should be rooting for, and the military are the idiots. But they they still want us on their side. Yeah. I'm wondering how much, I'm wondering how much of that has to do with, because uh, the, the, the DOD did contribute to the production of this movie. However, they did with they did they did pull their credit because they didn't like how they were portrayed but. <laughs> that's funny. It, it's funny you say that about the the end there that we're rooting for the military I, I say yes and no and i think this is where the movie gets very strange and confusing i mean not i mean it does it a few times obviously but i think the end spoilers i mean we said it earlier but they end up killing godzilla right uh, it gets trapped in a suspension bridge, which is a cool visual. I still think looks pretty great uh, to this day. It does. Um, but I remember watching this movie with my parents, and I remember my mom feeling like really upset at the movie, like when Godzilla is dying, and it it even starts to like kind of coo and purr like a dying dog, mm-hmm. you know. And and it and it, he moves so you can see these fucking missile holes in the side of its goddamn neck you know and then you realize that you are just watching an animal die in front of you so it it makes this weird moment where we're putting down an animal (laughs) in front of this this whole audience for for doing what so I, I push back a little tr- bit on what you're saying. But but that's true. But I'm going off of what the movie presents to us because it's a natural human instinct to feel bad when you see an animal killed. And like I brought this up on the, the Godzilla minus one episode of the Kaiju transmissions. I even felt a little bad when Godzilla was killed in that movie. Yeah, and but you're movie, a sadist. He's like he's much more like <laughs> he's obviously like more villainous. Right. But I still thought it was, it was kind of sad to watch him, you know, get hit with missiles and to be taken down. Oh, dude, the whole time it's, in that movie, I'm like, we got to fucking kill this guy. <laughs> well, but see, like, so, like, when you say like the here's here's the point I want to make about that is the the moment you're talking about where he dies on the bridge and suddenly it's like sad. 
that's the first time the movie even raises the idea that maybe we should feel bad about it. Because like our connect, our connected I disagree hero, with that. right? Our human character is Matthew Broderick. That's who we're on the side of. And when he sees all those like baby Godzillas and the eggs, his 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 entire reaction is. We got to get this thing bombed. We got to kill all these babies. Like, there's never a moment where he's like, "Well, maybe we should try and save these babies and like study them." Like, he is our hero. He's immediately like, "We need to take these out." And then, so then we see Godzilla sad about the babies. And again, that's the first time that like that sort of two parts of the movie where it raises the idea that, "Oh yeah, these are animals." But then Godzilla starts chasing them, and again, our human characters are just like, "Call, you know, like we got to form a plan. We got to get them somewhere to where the military can take them out." So I kind of say like, "Movie, you're trying to have your cake and eat it too." Oh, for sure. Late. Like, you can't suddenly have them kill Godzilla and then have Tatopoulos walk up and be like, aw. It's like, well, they, he had no connection with that character. They, they even rip off the thing they did in the 70s uh, King Kong remake where at the end um, you hear his heartbeat mm-hmm. slow yeah. down. And I, I'm not a big fan of the 70s Kong either, but, like, that movie at least, like, attempted to build a connection with the monster in the audience so it feels earned I guess I guess what this this movie needed to like to what this movie needed to like pay like actually have that scene be paying off something is it needed uh, definitely needed more like scenes earlier where Broderick shows some kind of sympathy for this monster or makes the argument that like maybe what we're doing is wrong and but it's not he's like very much like a we have to kill this thing the whole time too do you think the movie's asking any questions at all because I don't like, well, that's no. what I mean. Yeah, it's, that's, that's what, what I mean. I'm there's saying. No, there's no, there's no underlying thematic stuff going on. Well, I, guess, yeah. I, guess, I guess what I'm getting at is I understand what you're saying to a point with Broderick's character. He's still a little bit too Spielberg face the whole time for him to really say we got to kill it until until really the baby thing is happening where he's like we got to just blow this fucking thing to kingdom come you know. But mm-hmm. I think. Before that, he's like, oh, he's pregnant. Oh, it's his nest. Oh, he just wants to survive. Oh, like he is kind of seeding it. And I think when you're watching the movie, though, you still just see Godzilla as an animal. He walks through Manhattan, sure. And he destroys things, sure. But we don't really see any like real deaths. We don't see, we don't, we don't sit with the resonance of loss. We don't sit with that. So again, I'm saying, I'm not even trying to defend the movie at this point. What I'm getting at is, the feeling at the end there, that's why you feel strange. I think it does seed that this thing is just an animal and that's the take of the filmmakers, but they're just bad at it. Yeah. <laughs> you know that's what like, I, mean? like, I, I want to make, a, I want to make a different argument. I know this might be like, you know, the hottest of hot takes, but I'm just going to make the argument that Roland Emmerich is a bad filmmaker <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> when Godzilla dies, we see the military cheer and yeah. the Broderick goes and like hugs Audrey and in a better version of this movie, we would you could have the military cheer, but we as the audience would be like, hmm, I don't know, yeah. like you know, you like the irony of that would come across, or like it, the ooh, gross. But instead, I think the movie is very much like they want us to be like, yeah, we got it, you know. Like, and, and it doesn't help that the design is just inherently ugly, you know. Like like yeah. when when King Kong dies in those movies, you're sad about it because he's a cute ape, you know. He's 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 humanistic in that sense. But when you're watching just a giant lizard. Uh, you know, people don't care as much. And I, I just felt like the ending really hits a strange note that really makes you question what this movie is saying. And then what Matt said, it's not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think by the time you get to the end of the movie, like it's already way past its welcome. Sure. Yeah, so, so yeah. any sort of emotional resonance that you would have, like for me, I was like, I was already, annoyed that i was watching the movie and then when you had all the sequence that um with the with the raptor ripoffs um i was like this is this is stupid so by the time they get to the end of it i was just glad it was over like i I was ready to get out of there you know it's so funny you're you're talking about the raptor stuff and and it aping jurassic park you know what this movie really really lacks if you're gonna ape jurassic park don't you want to be scared like Jurassic Park Definitely. is is there's there's fear yeah. there's well terror. even that fr- that franchise forgot about that after well, a while that, too. that's that's true you're right um, this is a hodgepodge of a lot of like monster movie tropes yeah. but again it's lacking this emotionality it's lacking scares it's lacking like real emotions when Godzilla is running around I like I I do love the reaction when it steps. Uh, uh, almost on Hank Azaria and he at least shows some fucking terror or delight <laughs> that he's alive still like I like that
But then our characters are walking around Madison Square Garden with 200 mini Godzillas. And they're like, oh, maybe we should go now. Like, do you have enough footage on the camera? Oh, we smell like fish. That's weird. Uh, Okay, time to go. Like, there's no... That scene should be as horrific and terrifying as the Lost World where the raptors are in the tall grass. You know, like every time their tail swings up, you should be totally mortified. But yeah, in this no, movie, there, you just aren't. There comes a point by the end by like, you know, the at the point when they're in the cab and, you know, uh, in a foot chase. Well, foot versus cab with Godzilla. <laughs> and they're kind of like easily evading him. It really starts to feel like this is not that scary of a situation to be in. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, well, like, yeah, yeah. well, remember at the beginning, Godzilla's out running choppers and now he's he can't catch can't up. Can't catch up with a yeah. taxi. Hey, he those was, fuckers hey, he drive was, he... so fast in New York. <laughs> Hey, he was just knocked out by all those missiles in the water. I mean, okay. I get, you know, I get why these decisions are made and like any kind of decision movie like this, you think you'd take a moment and think this is probably like there was 10 meetings about this and constant revisions and thoughts about it. But even like the, the move early in the movie to like, you know, evacuate New York, which means for the rest, most of the movie, it's just kind of Godzilla rampaging through, you know, yeah. empty buildings and yeah. empty, it essentially just becomes a playground of stone for him. And it's like, well, okay, now you've taken out, like, this is what you were saying, Chris, is like, the human cost is not felt in this movie, no. because the movie doesn't necessarily have the balls to examine that. So it's like a disaster movie where the disaster isn't felt, even as much, like, the disaster, for as much as I don't like the movie, the disaster is felt in Independence Day. That is a movie about mass eradication of people. Mm-hmm. And that's not what this movie is doing, right? Like, there's there's some deaths, yes, but it's not felt on the scale that you would hope for. Not that I'm saying this needs to be as deep as minus one, but it just feels like it doesn't want to commit to, like you said, making the situation truly scary or, you know, full, full of tension. It's just like, I don't know, this thing's loose in the city. We got to capture it, but we can take our time because there's no one here. <laughs> you know, the tension I felt was the contempt that uh, Ebert and Jean had for each other in this movie. Oh boy, yeah. You want to talk <laughs> well, about the, the supporting contempt that cast Devlin, now? The, the the contempt that Emmerich and Devlin clearly had for Cisco. Oh, Nieper. for sure. I will yeah. say, I laughed a little bit at this movie for sure. I thought I thought they kind of nailed that they just hate each other. <laughs> you believe this? I don't, I, I don't know what's going on. You never know what's going on. Thank you. You sure you didn't know about this? No, no one told me anything about this. Why do I even keep you around? Well, you have the great Michael Lerner playing Mayor Ebert. Yeah. I'm doing uh, but a good no, that that Ebert. whole gag is just terrible. He's obsessed with eating candy, and uh, have you we have ever the... figured. Out, have we ever figured out why there are like three Simpsons performers in this? Or, no, like, I don't know. To, what's to ask up that with another that. way, like why at this point you have Hank Azaria in a, in a you know basically like fourth build, fourth you know lead. Then you have Harry. He's Shearer unbearable in, like, in this, by the way. F- he's really bad. You have Hank, Harry Shearer in a featured part, and then you have a small cameo from Nancy Cartwright. But then why not go? Why is why are why is not like, why isn't Yearly Smith here, too? Like, why not just push it even further and get him Yeah, all no, I, 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 I don't understand what's up with the, all the Simpsons cast in this. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, Trev, we got to mention him. We got to mention him. Uh, our, one of my favorites, Kevin Dunn. I'd say also innocent in this, just because Kevin Dunn, always innocent. Um, Kevin Dunn playing the main military commander in this. I love Kevin Dunn. If, uh, so I have this, I have this um, ongoing tradition now. <laughs> Where, and I know it confuses the hell out of Bird, and I'll never explain it because there's no explanation necessary. I, but every once understand. in a while, I don't know, a couple times a year, I'll spend a day just posting picture after picture of Kevin Dunn on Bird's Facebook page. <laughs> and just say, like, and then say, uh, you got dunned. Yeah, then he sends uh, me a message that says, you got dunned. And then he refuses to elaborate. It's there's no elaboration needed. Kevin Dunn is the best, and I <laughs> and I do enjoy seeing him even in this. So that's Kevin that's all Dunn, I one of the very very few cast members that uh, stuck around uh, to voice his character in the animated series. See what a mensch! He's a great guy. No, Kevin Dun- <laughs> Kevin Dunn's awesome. I mean, he's a he's a Transformers OG. You know, my so favorite you know? my favorite character in the Transformers <laughs> franchise. Yeah. Well, you didn't like when Optimus murders everyone. Well, I mean, my favorite human character in the Transformers. <laughs> my, uh, bloodthirsty, uh, psychotic optimist. Obviously. That's your favorite. That's your favorite. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what, one... Okay, can we... T- uh, let's have a score horror, okay? Mm-hmm. A little score horror let's moment. Let's do it. I, I think David Arnold's score... Uh, first of all, I like David Arnold. And I, I think something was sorely missed in the Bond franchise when Hans Zimmer took over. I think he he's very... He's got a triumphant kind of... Uh, motif style to him very classic Hollywood kind of like what you said before that he's you know aping John Williams a little bit but 
I'm into it. I thought the score was actually pretty good. I like I like the main theme song. I like the main score. The opening titles, I think, to this movie are pretty, pretty sweet. You get the choir. You get the drums. You get this epic sound to it. Uh... I, I like the score in this movie. I, I thought it's like, you know, it's it's pretty memorable, in my opinion. It's got motifs to it, which I always love, and it's something that is lost on a lot of movies nowadays, but I was into David Arnold in this. I like the score, too. Uh, there's some mo- some moments when uh, he's trying to ape the kind of awe and wonder of the the Jurassic Park score. Those moments don't quite work, but I, I, overall it's a decent score. Um uh, if you, if anyone out there really wants to learn about like the actual that um, Matt and I mentioned earlier the the virtual convention that we did uh, Kaiju Masterclass with Dave Ar- David Arnold was one of the guests and so uh, there's a whole interview with him about just the score to this movie. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, no, the the, the score is good. I when it's not pulling a lot of the the John Williams stuff, it, sure. I, I like it. Sure. Yeah, I think like I, I, this is going to sound meaner than I mean it to, but I think it's a perfectly serviceable score. That that sounds dismissive, but I, what I mean is I, I think it's always working. I, the only thing I would say is I don't find the main theme particularly like memorable or like iconic, but I think putting that aside, it, the, the the score works you know pretty much effectively all throughout the the, the running time of the movie. Yeah, I, w- I would agree with that actually. I mean the. The the score is probably the best executed anything in the movie. Like it's it's the most consistent. Which I mean, you know, if it's a blase score, you're, that tells you how good the movie probably is not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's two things I want to say before jumping into kind of the aftermath uh, and w- what this movie basically uh, did <laughs> to, to, to the uh, to, to the property and where we are now with it. Uh, but two things. Uh, anybody else reminded of Gremlins 2 with all the babies in the lobby uh, at the end there? Just oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, the second one is, again, I mentioned it before, but Come With Me by Diddy is pretty sweet still. Only second to Deepest Bluest by LL Cool J. <laughs> Can we talk about like my disappointment that we don't actually get to hear the Godzilla remix of Brain Stew in the movie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You guys know what I'm talking. So yeah, we yeah. So we didn't we didn't mention like we you know we mentioned the how big the P Diddy song was, but this movie had like a pretty like successful soundtrack as yeah, well. Yeah, I definitely had the CD. Jamiroquai. Uh, yeah, um, Wallflowers so, doing their cover yeah. of David Bowie's Heroes. But the the best thing on there and the most like memed thing afterwards and in, in like very early days of internet memes was um you know there was the 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 Godzilla remix of Brain Stew by Green Day where they just took the Green the Green Day song Brain Stew and occasionally added in a Godzilla roar <laughs> yeah, and then in, like, a very <laughs> a very a very early <laughs> meme online was to do Godzilla remixes of other songs including and now Bird this is gonna piss you <laughs> off I'm sure as much as me it seems to have been scrubbed from the internet I could not find what? it the other night but and I know you know exactly what I'm gonna bring up Ugh. was the Godzilla remix of Toss Salad and Scrambled Eggs from Frasier yep uh, yeah. So good, but I could not find it anywhere. <laughs> Leaving off on a Frasier reference, Trev. Classic you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but let's let's talk about the aftermath of this movie, uh, what it did to the character, Toho's response, and where we are now with uh, the MonsterVerse. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, that there's a little bit to unpack there because, like I said, at the time, it was like the sky was falling. I I mean, now Godzilla is uh, such an ingrained part of branding uh, Mm -hmm. that when a Godzilla movie comes out, there's never an anxiety that there'll never be another one. It's always like, oh, well, if I don't like this one, there's just going to be another one in a year or two, like every franchise now. But at the time, it was like, wow, this was like the one chance to make Godzilla mean something. And it was this and it was all doom and gloom. Um, and you know you had a uh, you know a lot of a lot of mixed reactions across the board um, in Japan, um, uh, you know some of the Godzilla suit actors uh, like Haro Nakajima and Ken Satsuma were were not very happy with it. Um, there's now a, I've always I've always heard though that Japanese audiences responded more positively to this overall. Is that true than like American? A audiences? little bit, um, yeah. more like, or less because. They like it was a cool novelty to them, right? So exactly, bet, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, you know, Shusuke Kaneko, who made the Gamera trilogy and uh, GMK, one of the b- better uh, Millennium Godzilla movies, he he brought up a really good point that um, 
you know, when he saw the movie, he was like, you know, it's it's funny that American monster, giant monsters always need to be killed by the military, you know, whereas in Japan, they they need to be killed by some crazy miracle of science or another monster. Like, they're mm-hmm. unstoppable. And I, I think that right, that right there is an interesting comparison because in, in Japan, they're dealing with earthquakes and tsunamis and they're constantly being threatened to be wiped off the face of the earth by things they can't control, whereas here... It's very much, yeah, our monsters, yeah, we're going to put them down because we're the best or whatever. Um, All together, yeah, you know, USA. USA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, Ken Satsuma, you know, he walked out of a screening at a convention in Chicago saying, like, this isn't Godzilla. This isn't, like, this, you know. Uh, and, yeah, I, I think uh, TriStar was... was we're really kind of banking on this to be like a big thing. And, you know, uh, well, they had a trilogy planned. Yep. Yep. Uh, and, and yeah, it, it gets, uh, interesting when you get into like 2004 Godzilla final wars, uh, Ruhe Kitamura comes up with the, because once their rights lapsed, Toho regained, gained control of like that Godzilla design. Like Toho can do whatever the, the Toho can make a movie now with that Godzilla and not, it wouldn't step on Sony's toes or anything. Right. And he, he, he was like, well, let's, let's make that Godzilla fight the Japanese Godzilla. And, uh, you know, the, the kind of joke was like their Godzilla took the God out of Godzilla and, you know, you watch the movie and the Japanese Godzilla kills him in like two seconds. And, uh, <laughs> That version in Godzilla Final Wars is renamed Zilla, and now Toho, Mar- Toho licenses that char- that version of Godzilla um, separately. But uh, it, I guess uh, I'm I'm trailing off, so I want to kind of get into. I said there's a net positive. So first of all, this this movie got Godzilla the brand out there. Like Matt said. Um, there is like a it's almost like the star wars prequels where there's like a contingent of younger fans that are like hey i know it's not like great but it's what got me into godzilla mm-hmm. you know some of that trend masters merch sells for crazy money now um so there's there's that element to it um but but as far as what it did over time you know at the moment it was horrible but over time you know it made enough money in japan that toho took their Godzilla uh, out of hibernation early. Um, and so it was like, they wouldn't have done that if the movie didn't make money. Sure. Um, but it also, like what Trev was saying, it also gives them a little bit more of, of a other leg to stand on where it's like, yeah, here's our Godzilla. And, you know, they can run at the same time if they want or if not, whatever. Uh, and, uh, it got us things like, uh, the Heisei, the 90s Godzilla movies, it got those released on VHS here, uh, and before that, they were not available here whatsoever outside of, you know, the bootleg circuit. The chain reaction goes into the, the 98, uh, movie into the Millennium series, which, like I said, the 98 movie was successful enough for Toe to keep making Godzilla movies. And then that leads us into 2014, which, you know, there's a whole 10-year gap there that's a whole other history lesson that people don't need to know right now. But, you know, (laughs) that also added, I think, some pressure in 2014 to be like, okay, I mean, there was no reason for me to believe that there would ever be another Hollywood Godzilla. It was like, okay, we had our chance, and we blew it, and it's never going to happen again. And suddenly it did, and it, it get that movie got a lot more right than wrong, mm-hmm. um, and now we're in the monster verse. And because the 2014 Godzilla movie was successful, now Toho is making their movies, and this is all kind of the dream they had back then, where it's like they can make their stuff, and they can rake in the money from the Hollywood stuff, and everyone's kind of okay. Yeah. Um, and that 2014 uh, it, movie, like, no matter what you think about it, is definitely very much a reaction to this movie. Yes, like, for, sure. And, for and, sure. and and the thing about this movie, though, is it still makes money for Toho. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and, and for the brand overall, I mean, um, uh, it's still one of the highest, maybe the highest, I'm not sure, I would have to double check, one of the very highest selling Godzilla movies on home video, one of the most uh, replayed Godzilla movies on cable, even to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so... Uh, Clearly, there's people that like it and respond to it, um, and uh, it, it, even in Japan, like uh, 
like I said, they, they can make Zilla merch, and that's, like, specifically the Final Wars version of this Godzilla, but, like, even in Japan, they still uh, make, like, kits and um, uh, toys and T-shirts of this God specific Godzilla with the green logo, the big iguana version. Um, and, and I think this movie is a little bit of an easier pill to swallow now also because, like, Toho themselves have done some crazy shit with Godzilla in the... the you know, years since, like, Shin Godzilla, he was this weird shape-shifting, constantly evolving thing, and then there's that animated trilogy where he's, like, a big plant thing that terraforms planets, well, and well, then... Well, that's, that's, that's the thing about Godzilla as a character, right? Like, people, and which we have done as well, you know, have rightfully so shit on this movie in many ways, but Godzilla, in general, is not without its own bruises and marks within the Toho way of doing things too. Yeah. You know, well, like, that's, and that speaks to like a, another point I want to make about it. Cause this movie has two <clears> things <throat> going for it. And like, one is that sometimes a franchise does need to make like its biggest misstep to kind of yeah. re, you know, reset sure. everything and recorrect, you know, you know, we, we, I look, I'm gonna die another day defender, but we get Casino Royale because people are like, maybe you've gotten too silly, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, that happens with franchises. But then the other thing, too, that's really important to remember, I think this is what Bird and Chris are getting to, this movie has the benefit. We're covering it on this podcast because it didn't give them the trilogy they wanted. But as Bird was saying, it's still a Godzilla movie. And yeah. when these failures happen in long-running franchises, they don't go away. They be, they remain a part of that long-running franchise. Chris, you and I had a talk similar to this when, like, the, Hall when the David Gordon Green Halloween sequels mm -hmm. weren't doing as well as the first one. And I kept saying, like, well, yeah, I don't think the studio is that worried, though, because... Halloween kills and Halloween ends, even if they don't make as much now, there are still going to be horror fans 20 years from now that are going to buy any special edition you put out of them. Totally. They're still going to get sold to streaming services. Like, those movies will remain profitable. And that's true of this movie. Like, yep. it's, it's always going to be watched in Godzilla marathons. It's still going to be, you know, put forward as a Godzilla movie that fans should see. So it's not going anywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm going to Japan in May of this nice. year. And uh, yeah, no, I can't wait. It's gonna be awesome. I can't wait. Uh, I will be on the lookout for a t-shirt. Uh <laughs> oh, there's yeah, no shortage of. I know the Godzilla go store for. in uh, where is it? I don't remember where it is. They have like it, five of them now. Yeah, yeah. So. They they okay. they have stuff like this. Sweet, um, sweet. And, buy, you know, I'm gonna buy, buy something for Trev for sure. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I, it, it's one of those things where like. I say this on our show all the time. Whenever we talk about a new Godzilla thing, or whenever a I mean, there's been, in my opinion, some of the takes Toho have given us since 1998 have been crazier than this. Uh, I always t say, like, it's not 1998 anymore, and, like, the way the fandom still is, like, so butthurt about this movie is kind of just, like, a get over it. Totally. It was a weird take on Godzilla that didn't quite work, and we've, we're gonna get more of those, and that's how... how these Like Trev was saying, that's how a lot of these characters and franchises stay alive, and, and you gotta do that <laughs> well Sometimes. even the the current monster verse is sort of reinventing itself as it goes you know oh like yeah the, yeah like it's... the 2014 uh, movie was deathly serious yeah and, and now we got you know kong with you know a gone writing on godzilla <laughs> you know <laughs> in kong yeah, like, with the thanos fist like it's it's all nonsense and that's kind of why i think we all do like or love godzilla as a character he, he is very malleable he and, really is. And, and now it's one of those things where, like, I don't know, this this movie is just, like, kind of a weird little footnote in the history totally. yeah. of Godzilla. Yeah. It's 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 memorable just for being so misguided. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, and, yeah. Uh, live Tre on because Tre of Trev was Trev was asking about, like, yeah, in Japan, it's not, I mean, it's not that they are in love with it, but it, you know, the reaction wasn't quite as visceral. And I, I mean, American Godzilla fans are just very passionate, where Japanese Godzilla fans are just... A lot more passive, but um, even within, I talked about Nakajima and Satsuma, the two suit actors from the the Showa and the Heisei uh, Godzilla eras. But uh, Matt and I interviewed um, Tom Kitagawa, who played Godzilla in most of the the two thousands run of Toho movies, and he he was saying he loves this movie, and he's like, yeah, I don't get why it, people hate it so much. He's like, and he's like, you know, that's one of my favorite Godzillas to draw, and like he showed us a little drawing he had on his desk of this, like, hmm. so, and and even Ruhei Kitamura, who uh, did the whole thing with, you know, oh, it's Zilla and having the Japanese Godzilla beat the American Godzilla, he even said, like, yeah, I don't really hate that movie. And Patrick Totopoulos got invited to the Final Wars premiere and was, like, super pumped that his Godzilla <laughs> was fighting the Japanese Godzilla. So, like, 
you know, it's not all it's not all uh, sour. So could Maria Patillo go to Japan and be like a star again? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I I don't it's know what Gojira, she's up to, you moron. but uh, <laughs> I, no, I yeah, that poor nice. girl really. <laughs> I, I think like. Just going back for a quick second, I think the biggest contribution that this movie has honestly made is just it. It got Godzilla 2000 was released here. It, it got a theatrical off. release for Godzilla yep. 2000. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I went to and, see that, and like yeah. it. There's it, it opened the door for Godzilla to be kind of more. I would say mainstream. You got all those the, the Heisei era films got released here for the first time. And now you look around and like there is Godzilla everywhere. Like oh, yeah. you can go to you Hot Topic and buy it. T-shirts. Yeah. You literally can't. And now you have an American. They're going to open up an American Godzilla store. Um, there's merch everywhere. And the thing about the MonsterVerse is like because if the movie is a moderate success, there is so much merch and the merch is selling so well that they're just going to keep making those movies. Yeah. Like yeah. It, you, we're, we're just – it's going to be – now we're just in content mode. Yeah. Like it, when this movie came out like – we really didn't know if we were ever going to get another Godzilla movie ever from Hollywood. It was going to be, yeah. Any, it, yeah. You know, it was like, wow, yeah. I guess this is it. <laughs> now so, it's like, we're never going to escape it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Godzilla is really having a moment right now. That's that's for sure. Uh, especially across the legendary stuff. And Minus One was so well received. Oh, up yeah. for an Oscar for special effects. Um, really uh, wild times. Fun times to be a Godzilla fan. Truly, I, I will um, say to give Emmerich some a little bit of credit, it does sound like the sequel they would have made would have acknowledged and tried to reverse a lot of what they got wrong here. Yeah, he wanted to do a little bit of the Monster Island, right? Or, yeah, or and, bring and they had Tab Island. Murphy, Tab yeah. Murphy, who wrote, uh, I think he wrote Gorillas in the Mist, um, Lion, I think he wrote Lion King, he wrote some stuff for Disney, but. Um, yeah, he had a script where uh, it it was it basically sounds like a movie version of the animated series, which is like the course correct they would have <laughs> wa- sure. would have uh, needed to do. Um, How many more mispronunciations of Titopolis do you think you could get across the whole trilogy? Oh, jeez, <laughs> Titiopolis. <laughs> Titiopolis. Um, that's that's a different kind of movie. But yeah, they they were they were gonna go to Seen us. It. The of sequel, the the okay. Ted Murphy wrote uh, a lot of the '90s Disney films, and yes, Gorillas in the Mist. Um, he has an interview on our Kaiju Masterclass channel too. But uh, he was uh, writing a story where it, it would have been taking place in Australia, and it very much would have been very similar to the animated series, where it's like you know they're they're kind of hunting down all these other monsters since Godzilla's shown up, and he fights a giant bee called the Queen Bitch. Definitely still had some of the 90s, you know, humor there. Oh, yeah. My favorite kind. I think that'll do it for Godzilla 98. Um, Yeah. You know, this movie has stood the test of time for many different reasons. A lot of the wrong reasons. A lot of the wrong reasons, for sure. But like we've said, it, it did springboard a, a brand new generation of fans so you know something nice to say about it i know trev is just stewing right now God, i hate the most no 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 I I, like, oh no 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 give me like my final say on that is like i agree like i think it's an interesting movie to talk about it's it's a it's an interesting movie in the history of this character so i can't be entirely dismissive i do think though that when you actually just put in the work of sitting down and watching it you are reminded that, like oh yeah it is just kind of a slog to watch but that doesn't mean that there weren't net yeah. positives from mm-hmm. it, you know, mm-hmm. like in terms of what it did to the overall legacy. It's, a, it's an followed. interesting, it's an interesting, uh, it has an interesting place just in the world of blockbuster movies. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, I mean, that at the well, very yeah. end of the 90s, there was like this last gasp of creature features. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I wanted to ask you guys that too. Not just, not the creature features thing. This is what I want to end on for me, at least, is I want to ask you guys, do you think that the failure of this movie, like as we said, you know, like not necessarily the box office failure, but like the result and failure of it, you know, not getting what they wanted and the merchandise and everything, was this the end of like this kind of blockbuster and in particular <laughs> like the presentation of this kind of blockbuster in the merch and the marketing? Because I think, you know, yeah. Yeah, that oh, yeah. started in a big way, obviously like Star Wars, but like really for like this modern era, the, or this era, it started with Batman '89, right? But then you saw like 
through the 90s, that kind of became the norm of yeah. like marketing movies this way. I, and then I was looking at like the next few years and like what the big box office hits were. And obviously, putting Star Wars aside, because that'll always be merged like crazy. But like the next year, the big hits are like The Matrix and The Sixth Sense, these like kind of more surprise hits. And then, yeah. or like The Mummy, which was like a surprise hit, but wasn't merchandised that way. And obviously, the internet starts to change. So I feel like this was the last movie that had that kind of yeah, like. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, out, like, yeah, I, I think they looked at how much money they spent and ultimately. Yeah couldn't make up from that marketing yeah was like, i think this way oh, was well, like the last cautionary tale of that yeah um it, yeah no i i think this was like a yeah we don't want to put any more toy companies out of business <laughs> kind of thing <laughs> again thanks guys for being on the episode uh for all those listening right now uh their podcast is kaiju transmissions we'll definitely put that in the episode description um next episode we are continuing Monster March Madness with Dragon Wars colon D War from Ooh, 2007. Boy. You're, <laughs> where yeah, <laughs> you're in for you're in for a ride. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. It's it's been great having having us on the show and um, love talking about Godzilla and really enjoy your episodes. Looking forward to the D War one. That's going to be a fun discussion. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, same though. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of, of the show and, uh, it's, it's nice to finally, uh, be here for something. Uh, this is, this is one that probably you guys talked about when you first came up with the, the pitch oh, for yeah. this, cause it's so infamous. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but no, this is, this has been, been great fun. Oh, you know what? I don't know if this is something you guys might do in the future, but this movie, uh, also, uh, killed off the original version of Peter Jackson's King Kong. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we don't do no, movies that weren't was... made, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, imagine, imagine. You know, our listenership is well moderate to say it best, but imagine the ones we of movies that just never happen and nobody can ever yeah. watch. <laughs> we call that the Guillermo del Toro podcast. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, if you ever get into the Jackson Kong, uh, yeah, that's a whole thing. This the fallout from this movie made every everyone nervous to make any kind of like monster movie for yeah. a long time. Um, but no, this was a good a good time. I look forward to the D Wars episode because I I'm sure you guys will have a lot of. I'm sure it'll be hilarious because that movie is insane. Something for a lot the, of reasons. The, the story behind that movie is also crazy, but. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I've stayed yeah. away from everything. I can't remember. I, I know I've seen the trailer like back in the day, but um... look into the director a lot because he's a lunatic. <laughs> yeah, he's and not it, kidding. It, he's <laughs> insane. And, and listeners, if that's not uh, <laughs> a, a, tease. a tease to to follow us at F two F Pod, that's at F two the number two F Pod on all the socials. Like us there. Like us everywhere. Uh, rate review whatever you do a star rating would be great also go throw a star rating on kaiju transmissions of course review them check them out uh and then uh, just join the tribe hit that subscribe and follow along the rest of the month as we continue monster march madness